Only one or only a few can actually engage directly in some spiritual process. It's very rare. And of those, of thousands and thousands of those enlightened souls whose aim is to attain spiritual advancement and enlightenment, only a few can actually reach the perfection of spiritual consciousness. It's very, very rare. So what are the characteristics of a person that makes them eligible to attain this path? Hmm? We'd like to give it to everybody. I mean, really, we would. We would like everybody to be as happy, everybody to be as free, everybody to be as satisfied as we are. But that's not possible because people have different desires. That's why there's all these different religions, all these different spiritual paths, teachings, methods, philosophies, and so on, all over the world, because people have different, different desires. Uh, uh, in a way, that's their misfortune, because if they would simply desire God, simply desire to be happy, simply desire to be in love, then that would be easy. <laughs> But because they have so many different desires, um, they become confused. They get led astray. Uh, they get entangled in illusion. What's the definition of illusion? Illusion is when God's energy is separated from God. Now, from one point of view, God's energy is never separated from God. Okay? But if we look at it the wrong way, we might think it is. Oh, I don't see God walking down the street, you know. He's not saying, he's not laying claim to this material world anywhere, huh? Where is he? Huh? Can you see him? Can you show him to me? Where is he? Come on. So they're looking out through the senses. Well, they'll never see God that way. Uh, they have to look within, then they might see. So when people say, well, can you show me God? Huh? They challenge us. Can you show me? Where is he? Come on. Well, are you qualified to see God? Huh? Do you know how to see God? That's our reply. And of course, most people don't. But nectar of devotion is giving the uh, actual method of how to see God, how to come face to face with God. And what is that method? It's devotional service. So there are... Uh, well, before I get to that, in this material world, one is engaged in different activities to get material results. That's why we're here. I want this, I want that, I want to enjoy this, I want to do that, I want to go here, I want to go there, I want to do this and that. So many desires. So we're entangled in this net of desire. And because of that, we're suffering in different ways uh, on account of the cause and effect relationship of karma. But when we finally get tired of this suffering and we say, no, actually, I want to find a way out of this, I can imagine that there's a state in which I would be happy all the time because I felt a little bit of happiness now and then. I know it's possible. So there must be a way out of this suffering so that I could be happy all the time. So then we start to search, we start to look, we start to go to the here and there, and listen to different teachings and hear different philosophies and practice different things. So after many, many attempts to actually gain happiness, we may finally come to uh, hear someone who is actually enlightened. And that's the beginning of our good fortune. So the qualification or the eligibility for the candidate for accepting devotional service the, the real path to enlightenment, is they have to be through with this business of sense gratification. They have to be through with the chasing after the illusory uh, enjoyment of this material world. And why is it illusory? Because it's not true. Huh? Like the Buddha says in Madhyamaka, huh? the, the world is the way it is. But we're looking at it in a perverted way. We're looking at it in the wrong way. So we don't see it as it is. We see it in some other way. Huh? If you don't believe what I'm talking about, just go down to the town hall and sit in the traffic court. 
huh? and listen to the witnesses from the prosecution and the defense talking about the same thing, the same event, the same exact experience. Huh? But because one is looking at it one way and one is looking at it the other way, their description sounds completely different. How is this possible? It's the same exact incident, the same exact experience. Huh? Yet, when the, when the cop gives his testimony, he says, Yes, Your Honor, uh, the, the man was clearly speeding at least 10 miles an hour over the limit. Huh? And the guy says, No, no, my, my speedometer doesn't even go up to 60. I don't even, you know... I can't, there's no way my car could be going that fast. I was, I had my foot on the brake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on and on and on like this. Or go, you know, any trial, just follow, you don't even have to go, just follow the newspapers or the, on the line. You'll see. People describe the same exact events in completely different ways. Why? They're looking at it different. In the same way, when we look at this material world with the eyes of one who wants to enjoy it, Huh? With the eyes of lust, I want this, I want that, I want to enjoy this, I want to. We see it in a different way than if we look at it with the eyes of, oh, this is God's energy, this is for His service. Now I have to go and find out how this can be engaged nicely so that uh, He is happy, so that everyone is happy. Huh? Then it's a whole different world. Simply because we're looking at it differently. Simply because our expectations are different, our consciousness is different. Right? So, when we look at this world as God's property, we see it very different from when we look at it as our property. Isn't it? So, when we start to look at this world as God's property, then the possibility of real happiness is there. Until then, all, the only happiness we can have is maybe a little temporary sense enjoyment. And then we have so much karma we have to pay. Uh, so that happiness is very fleeting. Uh, Prabhupada used to call it flickery. It is happiness in this material world is flickery. It is like a drop of water on a lotus leaf. Have you ever seen a lotus leaf? Huh? A lily pad. It's coated with this waxy substance that repels water. So if a drop of water gets on the lotus leaf and there's any slight disturbance or vibration, immediately it just falls off, it repels the water. So similarly, this material world is not really meant for our enjoyment. No. Any slight little disturbance in our enjoyment is finished immediately. So we have to take this material world in a different way, look at it in a different way then real happiness becomes possible. And what is that? Happiness means attraction for Krishna, attraction to God. When we become attracted to God, then our good fortune begins. Then our real happiness begins. Then uh, we actually become engaged in devotional service. We, we gain a service activity. I want to help. That's a service activity. Not, I want to take, but I want to give. Huh? That's love. Love means I want to give you something. I want to help you. I want to serve you. I want to make your life better in some way. And the best service that anybody can do is to give transcendental knowledge. The knowledge by which all ignorance is destroyed. The knowledge by which all suffering is destroyed. The knowledge that leads to enlightenment. That is real service. That is real help. Because it's the cure for all suffering, for all material problems. So that is the qualification. That is the eligibility of the candidate for accepting devotional service, for being engaged in spiritual life. He has to want to help. Not, oh, well, let me study this so I can solve my problems. But that's a very impure motive for engaging in spiritual life. It's not much different than solving your problems through some material means. Still, Krishna says there are four kinds of people who begin this process. Huh? One who's in distress, one who's in need of money, 
one who's curious, wants to know what's going on, and one who is situated in transcendental knowledge. And of those four, the last one, the wise one, the one who knows actually what is the purpose of life, what is the conclusion of Vedic knowledge, he's the best. Because, Krishna says, I am very dear to him and he is very dear to me. In other words, they love each other. They're in love. No? Everybody, has anyone ever tasted being in love, even for a little while? Then they always want to be in that state. Because being in love is like causeless pleasure, causeless happiness. You don't have to do anything. No? You just think of the beloved, it automatically, ah, oh, it's so much pleasure. Very nice. But in this material world, this love is temporary. Why?